as a way to sort of uh, frame this discussion about uh, technology and science, and which I think is one of the key areas where there's been an extraordinary and undiscussed, underdiscussed failure, um, it's worth reflecting how different our expectations about the future would have been had we been gathered here 40 years ago or 45 years ago in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and uh, if you had said, if you had asked people to um, do a bet on whether in the next 40 years um, we would send uh, someone to Mars, send a man to Mars, or whether a black person would get elected president of the United States, um, you would have gotten 10 to 1 odds on Mars. Maybe 100 to 1, but, but at least 10 to 1. Um, and I don't want to talk today about all the ways in which there's been a social and cultural change in the U.S. I want to talk about the things that have not changed and the way in which um, in almost every area of uh, scientific and technological progress, with the one very important exception of computers that I will, I will also uh, come back to, uh, we have uh, radically fallen short of the, uh, of the great expectations that we had in the past. Um, to take the most narrow, literal version, we are no longer moving faster. And this has been one of the main ways in which uh, progress was measured for decades and centuries. Uh, faster sailboats, faster railroads in the 19th century, faster cars, faster planes. It culminated with the Concorde in 1976. It was decommissioned in 2003. And today we're uh, probably back to about 1960-era travel speeds when you, um, when you include the very low-tech airport security systems that we have in place. Um, you know, this, this failure of, uh, uh, you know, the, and you know, if you, you can just sort of recall, uh, you know, they promised, us, uh, they promised us flying cars in the 1960s. We sort of got 140 characters on Twitter or something like that in, instead. Um, the failure, I think, in transportation um, reflects an extraordinary failure in, um, in energy innovation and uh, in the way in which um, um, energy prices have relentlessly moved higher over the last number of decades. The U.S. has never fully recovered from the oil shock of the 1970s. Um, real energy prices today are probably comparable to where uh, they were in the early, uh, um, in, 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 the, in the worst part of the, of the Carter era of the late 70s. Uh, the nuclear industry you know, has been dead for decades. It would probably be criminal to encourage an undergraduate to study nuclear engineering today. Um, and of course, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, all the sort of promised alternatives like clean tech have become really just toxic uh, words, uh, tox a toxic uh, word for ways to uh, lose money rather badly. Um, and I think this uh, failure in energy innovation um, probably has extended to um, almost all these uh, sort of commodity goods, which people thought of as um, a major area of progress. There was a, there was a very famous bet in uh, 1980 between the free market economist Julian Simon and, the, uh, and sort of the, uh, the ecologist Paul Ehrlich. Simon said, um, you know, a basket of commodities would go down in price over the course of the next decade. Ehrlich said um, uh, they would go up. Simon was right in the 80s. He famously won the bet. But if you were to look at that bet again, from 1993 onward, every single decade, 93 to 03, 94 to 04, um, Ehrlich has been uh, winning that bet. And I think that's sort of a strange commentary on uh, what has gone wrong. Food prices have escalated. Uh, if you, uh, the, the, the green revolution of the 50s and 60s of agricultural innovation um, has sort of stalled out very badly. Um, and so that, uh, you know, I think that uh, much of the Arab Spring can be interpreted not as, um, not as some great uh, victory for democracy, but as sort of the immediate byproduct of desperate people who became more hungry than scared as a result of um, immensely escalating food prices in, in recent decades. Uh, medical innovation is another area where uh, things seem very badly stalled out. The, uh, the, uh, there may be one third as many drugs uh, going through the FDA process as there were 20 years ago. Um, and our expectations about the future have also correspondingly been diminished. I think, uh, I think uh, um, in 1970, um, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Nixon administration famously declared war on cancer. Um, it was going to be defeated by the bicentennial six years later. Uh, 43 years have passed. Um, we are, in some sense, 43 years closer to the goal by definition. 
but, um, but there is a sense that it's further than six years away. And, um, and if you were to say, uh, ask for a crusade against Alzheimer's, which probably afflicts somewhere between a third and a half of uh, Americans age 85 and older, this would not even, um, this would not even sort of uh, gain attention. So uh, sort of there's been 40 years of, of slack and failure in area after area that we look at uh, to the point where even our expectations have been, um, have been uh, radically reduced for what can possibly d be done uh, going forward. Um, I think it's a very important question why this deceleration has taken place. Uh, there sort of is one type of argument that all the easy ideas were discovered, that it sort of is natural, we somehow ran out of ideas. Um, and I think the other version, which I'm more sympathetic to, is that it is somehow cultural and that we have, uh, we've stopped trying or we thought it wasn't a good thing to pursue these things anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and that in many ways uh, there's been incredible uh, regulation of, of innovation um, from and that, that sort of the areas that were very heavily regulated uh, basically uh, stalled out. And everything from aerospace to biotechnology to nuclear power to all these other industries have essentially been uh, regulated to death. And we can see this with the exceptions, the areas that were relatively lightly regulated. The least regulated industry in the U.S. was the uh, computer industry. And that has seen uh, 40 years of, uh, of, tremendous, uh, of tremendous progress. Um, but I think, um, and you know, I think that uh, it's easy to sort of turn up these computer companies into scapegoats because they obviously haven't quite delivered the goods. But I think it, uh, in terms of our whole economy, but I think it's, uh, I think it's also partially that, there, that, that it's not enough and computers alone can't do everything. And we have a sort of world where we've been allowed and we've had freedom to do things in the world of bits but we've had no freedom to do things in the world of stuff. Um, you can, maybe you can sort of interpret it as a kind of environmentalism where um, you're allowed to uh, manipulate a virtual world of information, but any time you do things with the real material world, that's illegal, that's sacred, that can't be touched at all. And the problem in some sense is that this um, sort of Cartesian dualism where we're able to do things in a virtual world but not in the real world ends up being um, economically quite uh, having only some limited value. And so you can send pictures of cats to friends halfway around the world, or you can, uh, on your iPad, you can watch uh, a cartoon version of the Jetsons while uh, riding a 19th century subway system that's falling apart in New York City. Um, and, um, and there's some value in being able to do this, but it doesn't quite translate economically. And I think the the sort of the big economic uh, data point that I always cite in this is that if we look at 40-year intervals, 1933 to 1973, 73 to 2013. 33 to 73, average incomes in the U.S. went up 350% after inflation. 73 to 2013, they went up 22%. Um, and this sort of, and you know, there are all, all sorts of caveats to this, uh, but uh, even when you add all of them in, it doesn't change sort of the basic uh, reality. There's been this incredible deceleration and this incredible sense of, uh, of stagnation um, that, has, that has resulted where we have essentially um, outlawed and banned um, massive areas of, uh, of technology from what we can do in our society. Uh, it's, it's sort of the, uh, you know, one, one way I've described it is that, uh, you know, this, I, I think it somehow happened in the 1970s and that uh, this is, of course, the decade that liberals never really like to talk about. They always like talking about the 80s, and that's when things sort of went wrong. But things really went wrong in the 1970s, um, and that's when we really had this um, radical separation between the world of information and the world of stuff. Um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, there are iconic things you can point to. So we landed on the moon in July of 1969. Three weeks later, uh, Woodstock began, and you know that was perhaps the point at which the hippies more or less took over the country, and the genuine cultural war over over progress was lost. Or perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, um, you know the most important place where the real and the virtual were separated was on the currency level, where in August of 1971 we went off the gold standard. And while you might describe it as a barbaric relic, it did have a sort of way of anchoring money into the real world and the real economy. And when you radically separated them, you can have all these ways you can print money, manipulate it, and things like that, 
but the problem is there are limits to what you can buy with it. You can buy, in San Francisco where I live, you can buy old Victorian houses, uh, but you can't buy anything new. It's illegal to basically manipulate things and build new things. This is parenthetically not just a problem in technological innovation, it's also a problem in many other areas. Empire State Building in New York City was built in 15 months in 1931-32. World Trade Center is taking um, 10 years and counting to rebuild. The Golden Gate Bridge was built in three years in the 1930s. Uh, at this point, there's a Nancy Pelosi-funded access road uh, that's costing seven years, and uh, more in real dollars uh, than the original bridge to build. And so, uh, and this is sort of a, you know, a, a problem that we see in many of these areas uh, across the board. Um, I, th I think that uh, what this sort of technological deceleration perspective leads me to think is that you know, the most important policy area on the economic side that we need to reform is all the microeconomic stuff. We need to enable people to actually do things again. And um, it's not fundamentally about macroeconomic policies, how much money we print or how little we print. I think there's some mistakes being made there, but I think, uh, I think the real issue is not to let this virtual world be confused with the real world. And I think it suggests um, you know, a number of, uh, it helps explain a number of the strange things that have happened in this country over recent decades and gives us um, a somewhat different perspective on what is going on today. And in brief time I have, I just wanna mention uh, three areas where it suggests a somewhat different uh, perspective on things. Um, one of the strange economic phenomena in the U.S. and indeed, you know, the entire developed world has been this series of extraordinary bubbles that we've had in recent decades. It's really historically unprecedented. There was a crazy bubble in the 1720s and the 1920s. There had been basically two in the 300-year history of the modern world, and we've had four or five in just the last uh, quarter century. There was one in Japan in the 80s, there was um, the tech bubble in the U.S. in the 90s. There was a housing finance bubble in the 2000s. And uh, we probably have an even crazier government bubble um, that's getting started and really getting inflated uh, even as we speak today, not just in the U.S., but also all other developed countries. And these bubbles happen because people have great expectations of progress that they've been told. Um, and these expectations are no longer tenable in a world of, um, of fundamentally slowed innovation. And so uh, it is a, you know, a credit crisis and a technology crisis have this in common, that they both involve, um, they're both based on a future that doesn't uh, live up to, uh, to the um, past expectations. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I will pay you a dollar on Tuesday for a hamburger today. Uh, it works if you earn a dollar on Tuesday. Um, you can buy a house and pay it off if everything gets better over time. If it does not, uh, you're likely to have quite a big crisis. And as we, you know, I know there's a lot of cause for pessimism, but one optimistic thread in this is that uh, um, there's absolutely nothing in my mind, very little, I should say, very little that can be read into uh, the, the, the election in 2012, just as I think there was not too much one should have read into Clinton's re-election in 96 or Bush's re-election in 04. They happened because of bubbles. We had a tech bubble that helped Clinton get re-elected. We had a housing bubble that helped Bush get re-elected. And we have a, a trillion dollar uh, borrowing bubble that um, helped uh, the current president get reelected. Um, and these bubbles will end. And when they end, you will end up with a completely different perspective on, on things. So I think, um, I think uh, we should figure out what a world looks like where you don't have uh, bubbles fueling things and how we uh, make such a world non-catastrophic. But as a, as a very basic starting point, uh, we have to realize that we're in a bubble that's crazier bigger than any of the ones we've had in the past. It's like, uh, and, um, and it's probably, there's something about it that's fundamentally uh, very, very unsustainable. And so I think that is sort of the silver lining from a tactical uh, partisan perspective that, uh, that we have to have on the situation. Uh, I think one of the challenges, however, in a stagnant world for Republicans is that um, it is a big problem for the core constituencies of the Republican Party. Um, I, I think the famous Carol Quigley line that the uh, Republicans are the party of the middle class and the Democrats are the party of everyone else is, um, is still uh, as true today as when he wrote it um, in the early 60s. And, um, and if you define the American middle class and upper middle class as the people who have 
a dream of a um, always better and inc improving future, that's actually very different from the expectations of people who are desperately poor and think things will never change, or perhaps the, uh, the super rich. And so we have a world where most of the millionaires are Republicans, and most of the billionaires are Democrats. And this is sort of a, an issue we need to think about uh, very clearly. And in a stagnant world, you have to, um, you know, there's going to be political pressure to get rid of what the Republican Party represents and to get rid of the middle and upper middle class. You can have a stagnant world with a few rich people and many desperately poor people. You cannot have um, a broad group of people that expects to do better and better year after year after year. Um, and I think that, uh, well, I don't have time for this today. Uh, I, I suspect that every single one of uh, the current administration's policies um, involves transfers away from um, the middle and upper middle class, but not primarily to the poor. Uh, uh, they're officially to the poor, but they're primarily towards, uh, towards the super wealthy, non-Republican uh, uh, people in this country. And that, that would be sort of a very interesting theme uh, to explore at, at, at some length. The, the, third, um, uh, the third theme that this technological slowdown stagnation thesis suggests um, is, um, is it does give us a very different perspective on the current administration. I know, I know conservatives often like to describe it as socialist or communist. Um, but I think this is somehow uh, very, very wrong when you look at the world through the prism of technological and scientific progress. Karl Marx was optimistic, deterministic, and concerned about, uh, uh, fundamentally concerned about the real world. Um, and the uh, current uh, administration is fundamentally pessimistic, um, indeterminate, and um, concerned about great abstractions. And uh, while I I realize this may not be the right place to say this. Uh, it may sound like a, uh, but I, I find the original Marx considerably more appealing than um, the current uh, counterfeit version. And I think, um, and I think that uh, if you want to have, um, if you want to have a critique of um, of the current administration, you could perhaps begin with Marx, Engels, Lenin. What would they have actually said? Um, Lenin, where is your five-year plan? You're going to have such a big government. How are you measuring what it's doing? How much are they doing? I mean, socialism only works with a five-year plan. You can't have socialism without a five-year plan. That's just a complete racket. I know that the numbers by the Brezhnev era got screwed up, but you know, we initially at least started to have five-year plans in which we could measure our progress. Or drilling down on specifics on something like energy. Uh, you know, the five-year plan in the 1920s was rural electrification of the Soviet Union. So you at least had concrete specifics that you could be measured against whether they succeeded or failed. Um, whereas today, um, the, um, it is not a specific energy policy. It is an abstract portfolio, a hundred different uh, universities experimenting with different kinds of things. Nobody knows what's going to work or what's not going to work. Every, um, every, uh, every failure is excused through portfolio theory, um, and, uh, and nobody has an idea of what might work instead. And for that matter, I would say the Republican critique is also tends to be not very scientific or technological. You take something like Solyndra. Um, you can look at a cylindrically shaped solar panel and say it has one over pi, the efficiency of a flat solar panel. That's basically high school geometry. Um, and you can just look at the shape of it and say it could have never worked. Um, but that kind of argument uh, does not um, even come close to resonating in a world that's simply no longer interested in, uh, in science or, or technology. And of course, um, you know, Engels would have said something like, you know, dialectical materialism is fundamentally about progress. It's about never-ending progress. And um, what would he have said of a world where a so-called progressive has dropped the word progress and substituted the word change for the word progress. And is not the substitution of the word change for the word progress a sort of massive decline? Because it means that you no longer can measure things, you no longer think that there is an alpha and an omega to the liberal history of the world. Um, and I think that um, if you want sort of the label for this, I think you could perhaps go to Karl Marx's PhD thesis from the mid-19th century, 
um, which was on Epicureanism, which I think was the specter that always haunted Marx. It was that the workers uh, would no longer want to work. They would, uh, they would want to have a work-life balance. They'd want to spend all their time playing golf or, um, or doing various things like that. They would no longer believe that it made sense to have a revolution or even to work. Um, and, um, and in some ways, I think that is sort of uh, the sort of pessimistic Epicureanism is, is really the, um, the ethos of a stagnant uh, society where, um, where people no longer think it makes sense to work towards a better future. Uh, one of my, um, I was talking to one of my investors in PayPal years ago, um, and we were talking about his kids, and, and uh, I asked him, do you think your kids will be better off than you? And he said, absolutely no, I, have, I don't even have any hope of that. Um, I only hope they will be happy. Um, and I think that is, that is sort of this, this, uh, this very widespread pessimistic zeitgeist um, that, uh, that uh, we have to somehow, um, we have to somehow, uh, somehow overcome. Now, the, the problem um, with um, a Cartesian economy or an Epicurean philosophy is that that's not really, I think that's not really the end point. And the end point of a world um, where there is incredible stagnation is that you end up with the specter of Malthus coming back, the specter of scarcity um, coming back in all these different forms. And I think the, uh, I think the uh, disturbing uh, truth in my mind is that, uh, is that we are confronted with, um, with a number of um, Malthusian situations as a result of this lack of innovation. Um, it is, um, you know, and it is, of course, very, very hidden. So, you know, in the U.S., we have um, fiat money that pays for fake food, um, which, uh, you know, and people are probably nutritionally pretty undernourished, but it sort of manifests itself in a diet of corn syrup and an explosion of obesity. Um, and, uh, and you have this in sort of many other, other contexts. And I think the, the attitude that we must have as, uh, as uh, libertarians and conservatives is not um, like the current administration to accept the decline and not to be in denial about the decline. These are not the only two mo modes of, of reasoning. It's not acceptance or denial, but I would suggest that we should try to fight it and that uh, America should not go gently into that good night. Thank you.